So hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to uh, have you today. Uh, so my name is Tamika uh, Sitches Spruce. I am uh, the lead in director here at um, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. And today uh, I will be uh, talking about uh, disability justice in the workplace. So really excited to do this presentation for all of you today. So, uh, you know, I definitely uh, welcome questions. Uh, please feel free to ask questions during uh, the presentation. You can put it um, in the chat. Um, also, I will make sure to get to uh, the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so what's at the end of the presentation, uh, and if you want to get, uh, want to ask a question or leave a comment, uh, you can uh, mute, raise your hand, or type in the chat. Um, also, um, if you wish to speak to, please rename yourself and um, add your preferred pronouns to your name. And uh, the chat moderator uh, will help me um, was, uh, ask a question for you. Uh, as far as access, uh, we must have that. And so we today have an ASL interpreter and also a live captioner um, available here on Zoom. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and streamed live on Facebook. Um, also, we will upload our presentations to our YouTube page, uh, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. And uh, presenter, uh, we will, I will also give you a visual description of the images uh, that is on the presentation. If I miss one, uh, please let me know. And uh, I will send the slides and the link to the recording to all that registered. Um, on uh, the image here, we have uh, an ASL uh, sign language uh, there, and uh, there's uh, a fist, or, you know, there's uh, very colors of hands doing sign language. And as far as my image description, I am a, a brown skinned woman uh, with long black hair and I wear the leopard a shirt and a, a brown sweater. Um, so here at MDRC, our mission is to uh, cultivate disability pride and strengthen disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. So we are very much of an organization that is big about intersection, intersectionality and to uh, uplift uh, various voices. And again, we see disability as not a bad thing, uh, but as just a part of the human experience. And uh, the picture here is uh, Mrs. Michigan Disability Rights Coalition and uh, in orange. <laughs> um, as far as our work, uh, we uh, definitely heavily into disability justice, um, also any uh, violence, racial equity, increasing tech access, cultivating leaders. Uh, we have provided uh, COVID resources and any social isolation. And so we provide trainees, resources, services to individuals, parents, children, children, professionals, and organizations. And um, there's an image here that says Disability Rights Coalition in purple and black, and it says with liberty and access for all. 
of some of the programs that we have here at FDRC is that we have uh, LFI, which is Leaders for Inclusion program uh, that is provided for young adults 18 to 26. And so uh, they provide information tools and really build the skill sets to develop leaders, um, you know, to help people, young people, uh, and their advocacy skills and, uh, you know, just help them become a better disability advocate. And they also uh, find paid leadership opportunities and employment for the youth, the young adults. Then we have our Power Heart Pride, uh, which is later this month. That is an annual event for young girls with disabilities. Um, and then we have LEAD, that is for BIPOC adults. Uh, BIPOC is like Indigenous people of color. So we have uh, for BIPOC adults who are IDD and parents of uh, BIPOC children with IDD with information tools and skills to become leaders in the disability community. And then also we have uh, the Michigan System Technology Program where we increase access to um, existing technology that people may have in Michigan. And then there is uh, the program that I run with Lead In. And so Lead In is a community practice program that supports organizations that primarily serve BIPOC communities to reach their inclusion goals for people with developmental disabilities. And so I work with uh, three organizations right now um, in the Detroit area. And so uh, we just help them with their you know, again, their inclusion goals, and how to be inclusive to people with disabilities, uh, both internally within their, uh, excuse me, organization, as far as their employees, uh, but then also how they provide a service to people with disabilities. And so we have a, a picture here with myself and um, the leaders that's in the program. Um, and so all these programs or particularly uh, the leadership programs, including Lead In, uh, would not be possible without the Michigan Developmental Disability Council. So I uh, most definitely want to acknowledge them. And so today, um, you know, we'll be learning, uh, you'll be learning the principles of disability justice. Uh, the difference between disability uh, justice, accommodation, discuss why it matters, uh, the importance of intersectional lens to disability work, uh, the importance of focusing and understanding the racial, ethnic, and gender equity uh, when it comes to advocating for disability inclusion, and also understand the best practices for um, creating meaningful and just employment practices designed to help rehire and retain people with disabilities. So you really will be provided uh, a variety of you know, perspective on uh, disability justice and how to bring that into um, your workplace. And so uh, for those who just join us, um, if you have uh, questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat and I will make sure to uh, get to it um, after the presentation. So just to start with uh, the difference between disability rights and disability justice, I think, uh, you know, in the disability community, we're very familiar with, uh, you know, what disability rights are, you know, which is pretty much the civil rights of of, of people, you know, with disabilities. And it, you know, was and is still necessary, you know, because it recognizes our uh, agency and civil rights, uh, you know, help us to belong in the community. And, um, and we should get, have control 
over our um, lives. Um, so really disability justice is an extension of uh, disability rights because they like disability rights 2.0. But uh, disability justice really focuses on the whole person and respects all of their identities. Um, so when we enter to a space like for myself, for example, as a uh, black woman uh, with you know a physical disability, that what I advocate on issues is not just uh, you know disability, but I'm also bringing a perspective, you know, as a Black woman. So uh, it's very much is respecting and bringing in all of our identities. Also, it focuses on interdependence, not independence, which interdependence, which I'll get to later on um, in the presentation, but essentially, um, in short, it's about, you know, depending on one another and uh, recognizing that um, also is cross movement and our liberation is connected to other movements. So disability rights is not really an isolated movement, but uh, we also, uh, as we advocating for disability rights, we also advocating alongside the various other movements. So racial justice, gender justice, LGBTQ movements, we very much work uh, collectively with other communities. Uh, so disability justice uh, is a term that was coined uh, in 2005 by a collective of disabled career women of color, uh, Patty Byrne, Mia Bigness, is the late Stacey Milburn. And so uh, again, you know, this Billy Rice movie is great, uh, but again, it's bringing in disability justice, the intersections of race, gender, class, and sexuality, and how they play in the role of the oppression of people with disabilities. So again, we bring it in all of the identities and recognizing that. Um, and also within the disability justice framework that we include the experiences of, again, all multi-marginalized people. And so that's people of color. Also, we recognize immigrants, uh, the LGBTQIA+, plus, um, homeless people, uh, incarcerated people, and those who uh, have their ancestral lands stolen. So uh, we definitely bring those experiences and uh, identities to the forefront of the movement and include them in um, the movement. And so there are uh, 10 main uh, principles uh, you know, of disability justice, and these principles was created by Sins and Valid. Uh, we have a picture here of three uh, black women, uh, one is holding a camera, uh, the other is uh, in the wheelchair, and the um, other next to the with the wheelchair is uh, a woman that has a cane, and they are uh, smiling up into the camera taking a selfie. And so uh, with the, the first principle is of intersectionality. Uh, this was coined by Dr. Kimberly Quinshaw in 1899, 1989 sorry, to address how when Black women um, exist at the intersections of race, racism and sexism. And so, uh, you know, the Disability Justice Framework uses this same, again, idea of intersectionality, again, recognizing our multiple identities, especially as it relates to um, oppression. And so uh, that's, that's the first principle. And here is a picture of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. She is um, a brown-skinned woman uh, that has uh, locks and she's wearing uh, 
seemed like a lag take time. Um, another one is leadership of the most impacted. So disability justice really makes it a point that leadership of people uh, should be the most impacted should be in leadership. So when we talk about ableism and talk about the lives of disabled people, the, the leaders should not be um, only like scholars or academia or, uh, you know, able-bodied people. It should be the, when we talk about things that affect disabled people, ableism, it should be those who are the most impacted. Um, in the social justice uh, community, we say, you know, that the most, uh, the people that's closest to the problem are the closest to the solution. And so, um, we, we really see this as an imperative to include people uh, with change or, you know, things that needs to be changed that, you know, we bring them to be the center of, of that change. And so that is um, the second principle. Uh, then there's anti-capitalist politics. This is the principle essentially that says, our worth is as person does not depend on how much we can produce. And so discipline justice really pushes back against uh, the level that the capitalist culture expects, which is produce, 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 even you know, at the expense of your physical and mental health. Um, and so, you know, it's really it's like the worth of the person is not based upon how much they can produce but based upon just being, you know, a human being. So uh, that's why we really pretty much push back on the capitalist culture. Uh, and then also we recognize that the systematic poverty uh, that people just very forced into once they're unable to work. And so um, as you, you know, may know that, you know, when you uh, have disability and, you know, there's a whole system in place uh, that makes it really hard to work. And so, uh, you know, it's, it creates the systematic poverty. Then we have cross-movement solidarity. And so it goes back to what I said before, is that disability justice combines other types of movements. So, um, also like racial justice, environmental justice, um, you know, many other movements. And that is because that, you know, um, the demographic of people, you know, includes people with disabilities. So, you know, we are in the racial justice movement, the environmental justice movement and other movements. And, and, and it's, a, and we are at times disproportionately part of the movement due to the environmental uh, racism or you know racial uh, justice issues and, and things like that. So uh, you know that's why we you know actively seek uh, combining and working with other movements. Um, the fifth principle is that we recognize disability wholeness. And so uh, we hold that disabled people are whole. You know, we are not less than because of our uh, disability. So, you know, really ties into, you know, disability pride uh, as well. Uh, we know in society that, you know, we see, sometimes people see disability as, you know, a bad thing or, uh, you know, like less than or, you know, and things like that. So, you know, it's just like, no, I am a whole person. I don't need to be fixed. I don't need to be changed. You know, uh, I am a whole person. Um, and so we re really recognize that um, in this space. Of uh, sustainability, uh, that really goes into um, you know, as disabled people um, with, you know, sometimes with, you know, different health conditions and such, 
that we may not be able to, you know, do the work as fast or uh, just to keep going, you know, and things like that. Sometimes again, health conditions and things pop up where we need to stop or slow down. And so, and that's necessary, um, you know, self-care and, and all those things are necessary because it sustains the movement. Because if we uh, just work, work, work and push our bodies beyond the limit where we're doing harm to ourselves, it's also harming uh, the movement. And so uh, the, the, it's really keen on, uh, you know, to be sustainable, you know, it's okay to take breaks, it's okay to stop, it's okay to slow down uh, when it comes to doing the work so we don't get burnt out. Um, and then there is commitment to cross-disability solidarity. And so, uh, you know, their disability, we know, runs uh, the gamut. And so uh, we really uh, want to be intentional that we don't leave any disabled people out. So I know personally, for me, you know, when I advocate on issues, you know, I also bring in like, you know, uh, my community who have, you know, chronic illnesses or, you know, people who are uh, neurodiverse and, you know, people who are deaf or, who may have cognitive disabilities. And so, you know, it's not good to work in silos, but really work uh, together across disability. So uh, that is uh, the seventh, seventh principle uh, to disability justice is commitment to cross disability solidarity. And then it's interdependence. Um, which goes, which I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation, that it is okay to, you know, need help and, and, and work with, you know, um, the help from other people. You know, it allows us to work side by side and really create that community, um, you know, as we try to liberate all, you know, oppressed individuals. So it's not about, uh, you know, just solely, oh, I need to be independent. I need to do everything on my own. But it's recognizing that it's okay to reach out for help, you know, to work together, to create that care circle uh, and create that community that we can depend on one another to thrive. Then there's a uh, collective access. Uh, so that principle explains that disability justice, we create methods of doing things outside of not disabled, their typical norms. And so um, essentially that is saying that, you know, when we have meetings, when we provide, create spaces, that we want to make sure everyone has access to the the meeting have access to the space. We don't want to make sure we want to make sure that no one is left behind. And so uh, we're really key to collective access. And then we're about collective liberation. And so uh, you know we move together as people with mixed abilities, uh, you know, multiracial, multigender you know, mixed class across the sexual spectrum. We really don't want to leave no one behind um, as we're, you know, advocating uh, for change. So, uh, you know, acknowledges the decades local work of those that previously fought for liberation while also acknowledging what is yet to be. So, uh, we, you know, we really about, you know, moving, continuing the movement, and they're working together to, to, to get to where we need to go. So those are of, of the principles. And I know that's, you know, a lot, you know, when it comes to uh, content. So if you have any questions or 
comments, please uh, put it in the chat and I will make sure to get to those questions um, at the end. So now we're gonna talk about uh, the difference between disability justice and a little bit when it comes to accommodation. So the history of the job accommodation, we uh, know that this is under uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title I that prohibits discrimination based on employment. Um, it also uh, states that employers with over 25 employees and since 1994, uh, clear employers with over uh, employees uh, employers with over 15 employees that you cannot discriminate based upon disability. Uh, we do know that uh, the ADA also covers public services, public accommodations, and telecommunications. Uh, before the ADA, there was the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that mandated that only federal uh, contractors and programs can't discriminate against uh, people with disabilities. And so the Americans with Disabilities Act just, you know, expanded that law and pushed it um, further. Um, and so in other the ADA, it makes it unlawful to discriminate in employment which includes recruitment, firing, hiring, trading, job assess assignments, promotion, pay, benefits, layoff, leave, and all the other employment-related activities. So again, employers cannot discriminate against people with disabilities. And when it comes to all of these things, uh, however, there is limitations uh, when it comes to the ADA, um, and so it's based upon reasonable accommodations. And so, um, companies, you know, that may not have to provide uh, accommodations if it's undue hardship. Um, so, like, if it's, if it comes to financially, uh, that's how some of people uh, kind of. Uh, get out of it per se. Um, and also when it comes to, you know, uh, building structures and, and, and those type of things, if it's not readily, readily achievable, with, pretty much when it comes to um, financial hardship to the business, you know, to, to make the changes uh, that they say, well, we don't have to, you know, provide that. You know, which of course is very uh, fortunate. And so what we find a lot of companies and uh, you know employers do is they try to offer the bare minimum. You know, just enough not to get sued, you know, uh, which is not, uh, uh, of course, uh, a great way to um, handle business and to, uh, to, to manage, you know, employees to provide the bare minimum. And so uh, that's why with, you know, disability justice, which I would get to uh, why we need to go beyond that uh, to create a better workplace. Uh, there's a picture here that is uh, the do not sign. So really the disability justice is a frame is a social justice framework that goes beyond legalities. You know, it goes beyond, oh, we just offer the bare minimal. And it's like, well, how can we, you know, create a place of belonging, inclusion, you know, where people can really do their best job. Um, and so, you know, with accommodations, it's legally binded, it's based on the ADA. You know, but it has uh, again limitations. Uh, there's uh, a picture here of like a mind space, a mind mind mapping of different social justice terms like inclusion, justice, fairness, opportunity, and other different words. 
Um, and so the main difference, accommodations are reactive, meaning they are provided in response to the needs of individuals which di with disabilities, which of course, you know, you have to, um, you know, provide accommodations, but, uh, you know, it's really, in my perception, is reactive. Uh, disability justice, though, is proactive. It's aiming to create systematic change and address the root causes of in, in, um, inequality, inequity, and discrimination faced by people with disabilities and their intersections. So it's thinking proactively instead of like thinking reactively. Um, also, accommodations at workplaces typically focus on meeting the needs of specific individuals. Again, when it comes to uh, you know, providing uh, the things that they need, but this would just the workplace will look at its policies um, and will be accountable to the systems that they create. And that's the key, you know, to companies will hold themselves accountable. Um, and the goal is to not to oppress, but oppress, but to create a healthy environment for everyone, including people with disabilities, can be part of and do their best you know, work. And so um, that is uh, the difference based upon my own perception. And so uh, that's just a little bit. Um, again, it, you know, I know that's some information. So if you have any questions or comments, or if you um, experience some, you know, uh, accommodations or um, things that, uh, you know, if you have any comments on, you know, that, that, that you see the difference between uh, disability justice and accommodations, um, if you can see the differences too, and some and have some examples of that, please put it in the chat. Uh, and so it talk about the intersectional lens to disability work. Um, so according to the US census.gov uh, that uh, not Hispanic Blacks, um, Black adults have higher rates of disability due to arthritis, diabetes, and hypertension. And so, you know, uh, and there's many reasons for this uh, when it comes to, you know, poverty, uh, when it comes to, you know, because we know with poverty, um, there's a correlation with uh, disability, even, you know, among uh, white disabled people as well. Uh, but then also, when it comes to race and disability, uh, there's, you know, unconscious racial bias in the medical systems. And then there's a social determinants of health, uh, which social determinants of health is um, essentially is a, is a public health term that looks at um, the various reasons of what determines people's uh, poor health outcomes. And so, uh, you know, so it looks at the environment, look at people's zip code, look at race, look at gender, um, and those different types of, of factors. Um, so that's what social determinants of health is. So uh, when it comes to race and disability, that uh, again, black adults have the higher rates of disability. Uh, when it comes to uh, you know education, uh, black children with disabilities are dis um, have a higher rate of being of facing disciplinary removal. Um, so when it comes to, you know, in school suspension, out of school suspension, expulsion, um, in 2017-2018, uh, uh, Black and African-American, Black and African-American children with disabilities ages 14 to 21 have exited school were more likely to drop out and less likely to graduate with regular high school diplomas than students they're all students with disabilities. And so, you know, when it comes to, you know, jobs and access to jobs and higher paid jobs, that definitely correlates 
with, you know, education. And so uh, that's why I, you know, brought this uh, statistic up to kind of show everyone um, some of the challenges that, uh, you know, Black people with disabilities face. Uh, when it comes to the Department of uh, Labor log, uh, exploring the intersections of Black history and disability history, the employment rate for working age Black Americans with disabilities was 20.5% uh, compared to 31.3% for individuals with disabilities of all other races. And so um, our uh, Black Americans with disabilities, our, our employment rate is lower, um, even just, you know, when compared to other uh, individuals with disabilities. And so, uh, you know, so when you account for, you know, race, when you account for gender, when you account for um, sexual orientation or immigrant status, you know, just to think, how does those identities affect employment opportunities? How does those identities um, face, you know, when it comes to the social barriers and, um, and things that they have to overcome to even become, to be gainfully employed? Um, there's a lot of barriers that exist. So um, as we do the work, you know, when it comes to advocating or when it comes to, you know, uh, employment opportunities, you know, as managers or, or such, we have to keep an account of, you know, making sure that we look at people intersectionally and to make sure they have the opportunities um, as well. So when it comes to uh, best practices for creating meaningful and just employment. Uh, I love this quote by uh, Patty Bird is that disability justice framework understands that all bodies are unique and essential and that all bodies have strengths and needs that must be met. We know that we are powerful, not despite the complexity of other bodies, but because of them. So uh, we're going to, again, look at the best practices when it comes to the disability justice framework. So uh, there is, uh, and I will put it up in the chat and I'll make sure to send it to all those who registered, but there is a disability justice toolkit uh, that was created uh, that really is a guide to uh, help uh, employers uh, and, and, and such to uh, mm -hmm. how to insert uh, disability justice mm -hmm. into uh, their you know work practices. So th this the following information is where uh, I got this from. So I will make sure that you all will have um, those who register will have access to this. Um, and so what with the disability justice toolkit, you know, is about thinking beyond the ADA checklist. Again, it's like, you know, when it comes to a lot of companies, it's like, we just, you know, use the ADA as a guideline, but it's also thinking about how to shift power that includes people with disabilities and, and the principles. And so it's thinking about uh, as a company, how you analyze your history of working with people with disabilities. Do you have any ableism practices? So that includes like examples of using old language like handicap or, um, and that's really, you know, I think that's a common old language that uh, many people use still to this day. So words like handicapped, um, you know, do you have log demanded log uh, demanding log hours at work and shape people if they make uh, if they need more breaks those type of things um, are able as some practices um, also companies think about do they have relationship with disability organizations up to hire 
affecting people with disabilities? Um, are they, you know, actively actively pursuing more knowledge or disability justice or becoming more aware of disability, different disabilities and disability issues and such? And um, how do they practice them? These are the questions that can kind of put put them uh, put you in the framework into thinking about shifting that power. Also, um, doing an internal audit, so that, you know, asking those questions, but then also it's about uh, again being proactive and thinking about: Do you uh, have the budget? that recognize the need for access supports. I know that's uh, one of the number one things that many companies have Well, our budget is tight. You know, we don't have the money to do, you know, various things. And so um, even though there is money uh, available, tax breaks and such that helps with uh, job accommodations and access to supports, but uh, so there is money available, but it gets thinking about how do you create that budget? Uh, do you maintain a list of access support vendors? Do you have a list of, you know, ASL interpreters and captioners and, uh, you know, places to do uh, Braille or, you know, so just various ways of access supports. Do you have a list of those people? Uh, do you have a protocol checklist or access writer for ensuring access happens at during events? So, uh, you know, the access writers there are people uh, that, that is their job to come and help companies when it comes to conferences and events to make sure that it's um, accessible to disabled people. So, um, you know, thinking about do you have that? as a, uh, a a vendor or access checklist? Uh, do you have standard emails uh, that you can send to people or orienting them towards access requests before meeting any event? So that's, that's another thing that I think a lot of companies don't really think about, you know? Like, so uh, instead of putting the old, uh, Put the pressure on employees to say, well, do you have, you know, uh, a, a captioning or your meeting or could we have captioning or instead of saying like, oh, can you use a mic at the, you know, at the meeting or whatever the case may be, instead of putting the ownership on the disabled people, just say it, you know, in an e email, you know, do, you know, this is what we're providing for those who may need access or, um, you know, if you need access, you know, please let us know. Um, so just having a standard email will be helpful. Um, and it goes back to when it comes to uh, job accommodations. So um, standard email that you can send to or orienting them towards uh, not only access requests, but uh, accommodations for the job. So the same process could be as well. So again, I just want to go back to thinking proactively um, instead of reactively. Uh, and then also when it comes to people, how many disabled people are working um, in your organization? Do you, you know, do you, do you know? Um, I know when it comes to, um, you know, people who have invisible, you know, disabilities as such, uh, you know, they, 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 you, won't, you won't be able to tell. So, uh, you know, understanding that you providing uh, those accommodations and, and, and make it readily uh, available, uh, you know, people who are, who may have not apparent or not visible disabilities, will appreciate that because, uh, you know, you put it out there, you're showing that you're, you know, able to uh, 
provide those accommodations. Uh, so, but thinking about how many disabled people are working in your organization, how many of those folks are in leadership? Um, is there a process of, you know, promoting of uh, disabled people? Uh, that understanding that number uh, will determine a lot. Um, is there a history of disabled people being forced to leave your organization actively or passively? Uh, that is another great thing too, because a lot of disabled people, again, that is, uh, they may have uh, invisible disabilities. And I've heard stories myself that, you know, they left the workplace. They, they, they left their job because, you know, their employers don't take them serious. You know, um, when they, um, you know, ask for accommodations or give them a really hard time and say, well, you know, you don't look disabled and, you know, those type of things. So um, it's, it's, you know, as people exiting, uh, the the company is understanding why maybe they have left, um, and, and then you get your your answer how uh, to do better so that you don't know, have uh, you know great talent leaving uh, the company. Um, another thing is uh, policy, and so. What is the policy around disability uh, when it comes to sick leave or uh, caregiving access request? Uh, what kind of, kind of documentation do you require in order for people so what to get access needs approved? If there's like, you know, some companies might have a laundry list of documentation you know, and that could be taught to itself, you know, that you need to go through all these steps, you know, to, to even, you know, request access or, you know, um, needs and, and those type of things. Um, and so just be a cognizant of the, you know, the, the, the amount of documentation and those type of things. Uh, when it comes to policy around sick time, disability time, uh, paid medical leave. Uh, do you also think about strategies of, you know, making it to work with disabled people, you know, are sick or is late or can't make it to the venue. So uh, because of access failure. So, you know, that really goes back to uh, sometimes, you know, people with disabilities might have to take, you know, public transportation or paratransit and they might get to, you know, work late or whatever the case may be. So just having policies um, and accommodations in place um, is very necessary uh, when it comes to uh, having disabled employees. And then also, how do you assess achievement uh, that are anti-ableist way? Um, I think there's, you know, some companies have a uh, uh, very uh, a rubric of you know okay they gotta do these sets of things to be able to you know to achieve to stay on the job for the job performance or to receive promotion and so it's really thinking about is this you know necessary for the job you know to be successful in it or is it um, you know, was not really necessary, but you know, it's um, it's 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 just something we would like, you know. Uh, and if it's if 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 the person proves that they're able to do the job, but then you know that they, they may not have the list of what you would like, you know, then is it be it is it being ableist in some way? Is it discriminating against people with disabilities? And so it's just really thinking through that um, as well. Um, I know another thing that uh, as I was doing, doing the work with the leaders that we talked about is job posting. 
and they have, you know, oftentimes, you know, with generic job posts, it says you have to lift, you know, 25 pounds or 50 pounds to be able to do this job. But we talked about a lot of jobs, you do not have to lift 25 or 50 pounds. So that is um, a prime example of, you know, being ableist, that, that you have a requirement that's not really necessary for the job. So, uh, you know, thinking about those type of things um, as you uh, do the work. And so there are uh, real life examples. I know this 1251, so I'm gonna get through this uh, real quickly so I can get to your questions and comments. Uh, so when it comes to intersectionality, you know, to uh, increase diverse employees, you know, uh, partner with a disability organization or vocational organizations. I know here in Michigan, we have uh, uh, Michigan Rehabilitation Services. So uh, you can very much uh, find qualified, you know, great people with disabilities through these organizations. Uh, partner with colleges and disability services on campus to find disabled, you know, students uh, and make sure to create a work environment that celebrates differences in the place that they feel uh, like they're valued. Uh, that's very uh, much, you know, important as well. Uh, to create diverse leadership, uh, you should have leaders who have disabilities within the organization. This shows to other people with disabilities they can be promoted within the organization. Um, also, when you are uh, providing a service, um, you know, as an organization, please include people with disabilities who are the most impacted, you know, in doing the work and not, you know, to, to co-lead those efforts. And so, you know, if you're looking within an organization how to help disabled employees or you create a better environment, make sure that committee is led by disabled people. Um, and again, when it comes to, you know, services, make sure that, you know, it's led by those, the most impacted to get their voice. Uh, and if you're going to analyze ableism practices, uh, please have a person with disability lead those efforts. And so it goes back to, you know, especially when it comes to policies, you know, reach out to, you know, us here at FDRC or, you know, there's other uh, uh, nonprofits or, you know, uh, individual uh, contractors, disabled people who are contractors to analyze the policies and practices. Uh, Cross-movement organizing. So uh, and this would be great, a DEI uh, type of, of uh, programs within companies. But so, you know, as you're learning about anti-racism and, you know, all those type of things, you know, uh, include disability in them as well. So you learn, you learn all of the different ways uh, that, you know, uh, stigma and biases can play into part. Uh, this will help you understand the various big issues and how to stop harmful practices. All the isms are interconnected. And here's a picture here that says, besides love, not hate, uh, see like C, Unite. Uh, and then also uh, understanding that, uh, you know, bring values, uh, sustaining minds and bodies. So it's okay to offer short breaks for workers, you know, when needed. Put that into the practice. I know there's some companies that have, you know, like um, mindfulness rooms and you know, offer uh, different uh, discounts or different things that helps people, uh, you know, with their 
behind their bodies and those type of things uh, to make sure they uh, their employees uh, are well, you know, uh, mind, body, and spirit. So, uh, you know, offering those things is um, also important. Uh, that will also, of course, benefit disabled workers. Um, also understand disabilities are not monolith. So, you know, treating people um, according to, you know, to who they are and to celebrate teamwork, create a work environment that is okay to ask for help. And again, everyone is uh, fully valued. Um, and, you know, understanding when it comes to collective liberation, understand this organization department, you have the power to shift workplaces to be truly equitable and to place all people, in this case, the, uh, people with disabilities can belong. So, uh, you know, companies could definitely be in that forefront of, you know, collective liberation. And so that is uh, the presentation. I'm going to uh, put the, or Adrian, if you could put the uh, survey in the chat. Uh, so please let me know your, your thoughts. Um, I definitely want to hear your feedback. Um, also, if you want more information on um, Lead In or about this presentation, uh, feel free to email me at Tamika, T A M E K A, at myfdrc.org. I will stop the share. Okay, you're going in and out. You're a little choppy. You're a little choppy, hey, today. Uh, so, just reading what's here. Okay, a Anna, so the anti capitalist principle of disability justice was ground shaking. For my perception of myself as a disabled person, it really helped me to recognize the internalized capitalist attitudes that made me feel guilty for resting, yes. But as that has the NAP ministry teaches rest is resistance and not a reward, but a requirement. And finding both of these things have made it much easier to accept and approach to my uh, approach my disabled disabled body neutrally. Yes, yes, that's very much uh, true. That it's okay to to rest and to you know uh, not go extra hard and, and and those type of things. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm a Native American Hispanic holder and now to save the teacher, yes. Okay, make a long story short. Okay, so the question is, does the EEOC really help? They seem to be far more for the employer. employer. Yeah, uh, your question, Anna. Uh, yeah, the EEOC is, which is the Equal, uh, equal Opportunity uh, Division. Yeah, it's, uh, they are supposed to provide um, assistance, you know, as far as if you feel like you're being discriminated against. Uh, I don't know what to do in that case, maybe reach out again to see if there's somebody else because you know sometimes within agencies it's depending on uh the person that you get so maybe reach it back out but there's i know there's the civil rights department oh, i don't know who would be 
the best. Maybe to look at to get an attorney. That you know, that's that. I think that's the probably the best next best step. If you feel like you're being discriminated against or your job, you're being let go unfairly, you know, and being discriminated against, um, I would say to look into get an attorney and see um, if that uh, if they'd be willing to take on the case. Yes. Uh, I'll just be right some Michigan. Yes. All right. So Eddie, as well, can we at one o'clock? So thank you very much for joining uh, me to today. I hope you learned um, a lot of information that you can, you know, take back and you know feel it part as well um, as uh, a disabled person and employee. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.